unpunished. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, we seek thy forgiveness, we, and we seek thy grace. Lord, we, we see in ourselves that we might be like the Egyptian army going forth in strength, going forth as if we were almighty ourselves and undefeatable, great people. Yet we see their ruin here. Yet we see thy grace toward thy people. And so we pray, Lord, for help as we look at this chapter, that it would examine us and it would give us some encouragement and some hope and some assurance in, in these uh, days of uh, troubles. Lord, be merciful to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, we're looking at Jeremiah chapter 46 and... You may think as we were reading through there, I'm not sure, it's in sort of poetic language. Uh, some of Jeremiah is written in prose and some of it's in poetry, but yeah, uh, most of this is a, is a poetic form. So it makes it a little bit difficult to be able to understand it. But you get the, the feeling, I think, there of this great Egyptian army going out and yet they get defeated. I don't know if you managed to grasp that in... What happens there it reminded me as we were reading it of the, of, of the Russians coming upon there uh, and finding that they weren't doing quite as well as they thought they were doing in Ukraine. But uh, there's a, some similarities, I'm sure, in there. Well, is there any hope for us? Well, we go from the previous chapter of Jeremiah and where we had Baruch and he was told, um, that he shouldn't be seeking great things for himself. And I think last week it was an encouraging uh, 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 message on that. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh, saith the Lord, but thy life will I give unto thee for a prey, a, a spoil of battle. You will keep your life, in other words, in all places whither thou goest. So, even um, Jerusalem was it, it was uh, destroyed, and that was not where Baruch's hope was. His hope was in the Lord giving him life, and that's what our hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ, to which we're to be contented with that. Um, now, the interesting question that comes to it then: if if this was the hope for Baruch. His hope was not found in Jerusalem, but in God keeping his life. Then uh, what is the rest of the world? If this was the hope for the Jews. What was the hope for the Gentiles? And chapter 46 and the few chapters following it deal with the Gentiles, the nations. And we see that it's the word of the Lord, which came to Jeremiah the prophet, against the Gentiles. It's not about the Gentiles, it's against the Gentiles. And it's teaching us that God is against the ungodly. In all their might, and in all their pride, and in all their strength, God is, is against them. Is, is there any hope for such? It does certainly looks ominous. In chapter 25, Jeremiah was prophesying a similar time against all, all the nations being destroyed by Babylon. Babylon so were taking over, which it uh, did um, at that time. The first then Gentile nation to be dealt with is Egypt, verse 2, against Egypt, against the army of Pharaoh, again, against, against, that's three against, against the Gentiles, against Egypt, and against the army of Pharaoh Necho, king of Egypt. Is there any hope for Egypt if God is so against them? Why is he against them? Well, they've a few years earlier, and we are going back a while here because we read that it's in the fourth year of Jehoiakim 
so six, <coughs> about 605 B, uh, BC, so we're, we're, we, it's 18 years or something before the fall of Jerusalem. So these chapters are were prophesied earlier, um, but they're put here together at this place, and I think they remind the people of God what is the ungodly world, what is happening to the ungodly world. They, they've, they've been dealt with themselves. God's preached to, to the church, as it were, to Israel in the Old Testament, and then now the nations. What about the nations? Can we learn anything? Jeremiah being prophet to the nations, as he was declared um, at the beginning of the book. So God is here both against Egypt itself, the nation, and against the army of the Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And so this, this year then takes us back to the year when the Babylonians defeated Egypt. The, um, the Egyptians were coming up against, the, the Egyptians were a great power, of course. Um, you can think back to the early days of, of um, the time when Joseph went into Egypt. It was the place where there was still food, the great empire that there was then. And even when Moses came out of Egypt, it was a great place. And um, and it was a place people looked to for great power and strength. And Isaiah wrote, wrote um, Isaiah 31, Woe to them that go down to Egypt for help. It was the place of great strength and power and stay or rely on horses and trust in chariots because there are many and in horsemen, horses from Egypt, they're great horses because they're very strong. Woe to them, they looked at Egypt, but they look not unto the Holy One of Israel, neither seek the Lord. Bible warns against trusting in men, trusting in power, trusting in politics, all these things. And so Jeremiah from verse three onwards vividly describes the uh, destruction of the people of Egypt. Uh, he describes them as they come to battle. And I think it only really makes sense to realize that this prophecy was written before the event. It doesn't really make sense to have it afterwards. It's not a description of what happened. Jeremiah is always giving it beforehand. Um, and uh, the buckler, the shield, draw near to battle. It's, it's picturing in verse 3, the Egyptian army, great army it was, coming up uh, against uh, the king of Babylon. But this is where he was defeated at. Verse 2, Carchemish, this is famous battle of Carchemish, which is the destruction of Egypt uh, the, and where the Babylonians really take over then from that point on, the Babylonian Empire really takes over. And um, something to remember is that four years before, so we're in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, four years before, was when Josiah died, do you remember, at Megiddo, on the way to Carchemish, when Egypt was going up to fight against Babylon um, and Assyria. Um, and Josiah, been a good king, got involved in it, and he got shot by an archer, by a, a bow, an arrow, at Megiddo. And then... That was by the Egyptians. And then um, Josiah shouldn't have been out. He didn't need to get involved. Why did he get involved in that? But nevertheless, they were they killed a godly king. The Egyptians killed a godly king. And they took his son, Jehoahaz, back to Egypt. And that was when they made Jehoiakim king instead of Jehoahaz. So the Egyptians had got control over Israel over Judah, while the other Babylonians were um, were uh, kept at bay for a short while. But then four years later, again at Carchemish, again the Egyptians then are defeated. 
Jeremiah prophesied this. And so the description then of the Egyptians, though, is never as very great. You see a proud, a strong people going on with this, these, a buckler is a small shield that you can hold uh, to defend you. And, and the big shields going to battle, harness the horses, get up. This is in the poetic language. Get up, ye horsemen, stand forth with your helmets, furbish the spears, put on the brigadines. That's the uh, cloak, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the metal uh, covering of armor, uh, I believe, um, chain mail or whatever it's called. They, and they, uh, they're they ready then um, to go into this battle. We would do well to put on the armour of God, wouldn't we, though, rather than this armour. What what strength is this mighty army, this great empire of Egypt, its whole army coming up in, in strength, as it were. It looks so strong. It looks invincible. Doesn't the world that we're against looks invincible? said christian put on the armor of god put on the faith of jesus christ put on the gospel put on the helmet of salvation and all these things and you'll be strong in christ and you'll be able to withstand the devil's attacks but the egyptians look strong the world looks strong the world with its incredible um to read I mean, if you actually think about it in the last week, is it the last few days, what, what happened that the government considered, well, so many things, but one of them, this, this strange idea that, that a man could change into a woman or vice versa. And it's, physically, it's impossible. Um, but yet now, to, that the government were, were actually realising there could be problems of, of bringing in a law to ban people dissuading anyone from doing such a foolish thing. And up in arms go the LGBT crowd and the government have, they haven't quite given in on this, but they've pretty well have given all their conference all on it has all been counseled. The people are resigning because the government aren't being strong enough on this. And it's as if the world has agreed that yes, a man can change into a woman or a woman into a man. People may feel like they want to do something like that, but it's impossible. You can consider things. They're absolutely impossible. But this is where the world's got to. But the strength of it, this is the, you might say, the frightening thing. It looks like these people are in charge. They're running the country. They're running the world virtually. It's absolutely ludicrous. Where are the people of God? What hope is there for us, we might think, in all this? Then we read that the the army of egypt i've seen them dismayed suddenly they turn back this is what the lord does their mighty ones are beaten down and fled apace and look not back for fear was round about said the lord so it's all suddenly changed they're running away and escape this is what the lord does to these mighty armies they haven't got what they think they've got like the russians Going into Ukraine, they have done a lot of evil and damage there, but many of them have been hurt unexpectedly, more, much more than they thought. They didn't have the power, they didn't have the strength that, that they thought they had at all. And this is the foolishness of the world fighting against God. And so we shouldn't be despondent. This powerful army suddenly being dismayed and turned away back. God can do it to the mighty opposers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He can turn people round. As mentioned, I think, the other day, one of the great Welsh preachers of the 18th century revival, he went to mock. He went to hear, was it, uh, was it Hal Harris or Daniel Rowland? Went, went to hear one of them to mock the preacher, to joke, as it were. The next thing he was converted and he became the great preacher of the revival of the 18th century, I should really quote the name, I apologise to the, to those that should be given honour where honour is due, um, look it up anyway. Um, so we shouldn't be despondent of the power of the enemies of the gospel. God can slay them in a second. He can turn them back. He can convert them, whatever is his will. 
Hebrews 11, verse 34, that phrase that he turned to flight the armies of the aliens, that they were coming. He turned them to flight. They were coming. And there was that other story of the Assyrians further back where 100,000, was it, or so many were slain. They went to the camp. They were all dead. The angel of the Lord had done it. Didn't take man. Didn't take our strength. And we trust in the Lord, not in Egypt and the like. See there in verse 8, the great sinful pride of Egypt. Egypt riseth up like a flood and his waters are moved like a river. It's a very powerful sign of the water rising, the, how the Nile flooded and watered the land. And, and he saith, I will go up, I will cover the earth, I will destroy the city and the inhabitants thereof. Thought he would had all the power to cover the earth. And he says, come up, the horses and rage, the chariots, going on verse 9. Let the mighty men come forth. And he hired, the Egyptians have hired, had hired um, soldiers from other countries, the Ethiopians and the Libyans that handle the shield. That's a fascinating element, this, the uh, shield. Uh, they, had a, they could hold a shield and they could defend themselves. The shield was mightier. Than the sword, uh, they could very strong in battle. And the Lydians, Lydian, Lydia, you may remember, was the other side of Turkey. So we're on, if I'm showing you the right direction around, thinking of Israel here and Syria and these places, Carchemish, and then right across the Mediterranean, the other side of Turkey, the long way across the Mediterranean, the other side of Turkey where Ephesus is, you know, Ephesus, that's where Lydia uh, was. And they, even soldiers from there, the Egyptians had got to join them. They were specially skilled in bending the bow. And as we read earlier, that's what killed Josiah. I don't know if it was one of the Lydian bow, bowmen, but they must be very good archers to have them in your battle. They're going up with their with their pride, with their specially hired uh soldiers to uh, take this battle on and then in verse 10 um, we read though what happens to these mighty men For this is the day of the lord god of hosts the egyptians thought they were just going up at carchemish against the babylonians because the babylonians aren't the people of god either but he, he is the Lord of all these armies. He is the, um, he is the real enemy of the wicked from whom they receive vengeance. This is what people are up against. They're fighting each other, fighting one thing. But I guess this is the day of the Lord God of hosts, the day of vengeance. God will, will deal with them that he may avenge him of his adversaries and the sword shall devour and it shall be satiated and made drunk with their blood for the lord god of hosts has a sacrifice in the north country by the river euphrates it's not a, a sacrifice in this in a the sense that we think of sacrifices for sin or anything but it's it's god's judgment here upon the egyptians the mighty power of god in the form of the babylonians using these enemies against evildoers, though themselves would be evil. We often look at our enemies, but we may also know that they are the chastisement of God, whether it's the Russians or whatever it is coming. They're not righteous. But God deals with people and sets them against each other. It's, it's a terrible war. It's a, it's a terrible thing, isn't it? Many cause coming from inside man, of course. Uh, but God overruling, God being sovereign in these dealings. Dealing here, this dealing with the proud, it's God's vengeance against them. How much of God's vengeance there must be today against the wicked. Um, but let us 
uh, be sure that we are on the Lord's side, that, that we're not, as it were, fighting against God ourselves. Well, uh, verse 11, uh, Jeremiah say so this is poetic language, so it's not always simplest to pick out every expression and try and think exactly what it is. But go up into Gilead and take balm, O virgin, the daughter of Egypt. In vain shalt thou use many medicines, for thou shalt not be cured. There's always an answer, isn't it? The wicked have always got an answer. They've always got another hope and another hope. There was balm in Gilead, this resin from a from a tree something from from plants that produced a, a, a could be used as a medicine but it's futile it won't save them they've got no cure for themselves and uh, jeremiah laments over the destruction coming upon judah in jeremiah 8 and verse 18 and he says, when I will comfort myself against sorrow, my heart is faint in me. Behold, the voice of the cry of the daughter of my people, because of the, them that dwell in a far country, is not the Lord in Zion, is not her king in her. Why have they provoked me to anger with their graven image and with strange vanities? The harvest is past. The summer is ended and we're not saved. For the hurt of the daughter of my people, am I hurt? I am black. Astonishment has taken hold on me. Is this it? Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? No balm again, no healing. There was healing balm in Gilead. There is salvation for the people who turn to the Lord. Yet this balm is of no use to those that are condemned, those that reject God. They can go searching for balm, searching for medicine, and it's not there. The Lord Jesus healed the woman that spent all her money on the physicians. He is the balm. He is the balm of Gilead that we need. He is the, the medicine, the only cure. The Egyptians looking for it they will not find it. Their own gods won't save them. There's no balm in Gilead for them. But there is for the people of God. There is a saviour, a great saviour. And he will save us. He will deliver us. We come in verse 12 then and see the shame that comes upon the wicked. The shame. You see, today people are just not ashamed. Of that brazen, they're not ashamed. But a day will come, a day will come when the wicked will be utterly ashamed. In, when their calamity comes on them in the day of judgment, if not before, they'll be utterly ashamed. And you see here in verse 12, the nations have heard of thy shame, verse 12, the, the defeat of this proud army, and thy cry hath filled the land for the mighty man have stumbled against the mighty and they've fallen both together. Here, the, the different uh, groups of them that are fighting together have all fallen over each other in, in confusion and fallen down and been destroyed. That such a great army could be destroyed, which could be no secret. Now, the other nations around know the shame of Egypt, going up to fight with pride. Their reputation is ruined. What shame there is on those that would put it to themselves to fight against God and to go against him. Their shame will be known. They won't escape the judgment of God. And doom follows. Chapter 13, then uh, sorry, verse 13, goes ahead to a time... Um, a, a, a time to come when Babylon will, will, will destroy these. At the moment, this is just that the Egyptians were pushed back, but it goes, it will go further. And verse 13 begins another section. The words that the Lord spake to Jeremiah the prophet, 
our Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, should come and smite the land of Egypt. Egypt had control over quite a large area, but they, they, they would lose that to the Babylonians and be pushed right back. Uh, and they're, they're, they're soldiers that are helping them. In verse 16, uh, he made many to fall. Yea, one fell upon another, and they said, Arise, let us go again to our own people and to the land of our nativity from the oppressing sword. It refers to the soldiers that had come from the other countries that we mentioned to help the Egyptians. They go back to the land of their birth. That seems to be the sense of that verse. And then, skip me through a little bit now, to verse 21. Um, her hired men. Uh, are in the midst of her like fatted bullocks, but they also are turned back and have fled away together. They did not stand because the day of their calamity was come upon them and the time of their visitation. And there's a danger, there's a lesson here, the danger of prosperity and comfort. The soldiers were like fatted bullocks. They become comfortable in Egypt and they weren't able to fight. This is could be a danger today for the people of God. We get too comfortable and we're not able to stand up as we should do. Comfort and prosperity can weaken the soldier, weaken the soldier of Christ as well, the spiritual soldier. But there's some hope now. Let's see. The, you've seen something of the ruin of, of the wicked. But there is a glimmer of hope here in the second part of Verse 26, I will deliver them into the hand of those that seek their lives and into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of his servants. And afterward it shall be inhabited as in the days of old, saith the Lord. So it's not a complete ruin for Egypt. It shall be inhabited again. Now, this is most fully prophesied in Isaiah 19, verse 23. It says, In that day shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria, and the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Israel, with, and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people. Well, the second look at that. Blessed be Egypt, my people. I was, was delighted to read that God will be merciful. These are godly people. It's going to happen to them. And Assyria, the work of my hands. And Israel, my inheritance. Well, this was to some extent fulfilled under the Persians who took who defeated later the Babylonians, but one empire after another. It can get a bit complicated. It's hard to say. You can't really simplify it too much. But the Persian Empire, remember, that's the one that reinstates um, Israel in the time of Ezra, and the people are sent back out of captivity. Um, and Ezra, Nehemiah, and Haggai, and Zechariah, and uh, Zerubbabel, and Shealtiel, it's Persia, Iran. Yeah, Persia's Iran now. It was called Persia uh, then, the Medes and the Persians. Again, to some extent, then again, under Alexander the Great, the empire brought everyone together in a sense. However, it's most clearly fulfilled. And I know some of you have got futuristic views, but it's most clearly fulfilled in the gospel. Romans 15 and verse 8. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. So the promises made to the fathers, to Abraham, fulfilled in Jesus Christ and the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy as it is written for thy cause will I confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. 
And again, he says, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. So you, we, we, we know that the, that the gospel soon spread to all the nations of the world. And so they join together with the people of Israel, the, the true Israel that accepted Jesus Christ, and the Gentiles join together. And now this is a fascinating subject for, for you in this in this. And in Hebrews 12, 2, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. And here, I'm coming into this because it's a special text. This is speaking of Jesus Christ, quoting from Psalm 22. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. And it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ in the Psalms, which were quoted in Romans 15 as well, leading the praise. And this is the most wonderful thing about the psalm singing, is that it's the Psalms of the Jews. And it's the songs of Jesus Christ leading them. And the Gentiles rejoice with the Jews in the gospel and in the singing of the Psalms. So. This is a, there is a little hope for Egypt. And there's a hope for an Egyptian today. There are Christians in Egypt today. And I'm told that though we're not, we're not keen on, <laughs> use the right expression, the Coptic church is basically Eastern Orthodox, which is very unorthodox in terms of the gospel. But I'm told that, that there are those there that are, are, that are evangelical and also that there are many that are, that are, as it were, aren't as Coptic as, as they might be. They're not as Eastern Orthodox. They're, they're more for hearing the gospel and of hearing the Bible and Bible teaching. I uh, have that from a, on a reliable, from a reliable source. So there's good news in Egypt for people that have come to Christ. Few that they made rather than this fight here there's been a highway they've come to israel to jesus christ and they have now got blessedness for the people of egypt for those that have turned to christ at least and then is there any hope for israel well any hope for israel in egypt this these last uh two verses of our chapter are quite astonishing although they've actually been in chapter 30 as well they've been in chapter 30. but fear thou not O my servant jacob verse 27 and be not dismayed as it's babylon's coming the king of babylon he's he's taking over everywhere um taking over egypt that was already that's already taken over uh, judah and uh now uh, this captivity but fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, and be not dismayed, O Israel, for behold, I will save thee from afar off, and thy seed from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return, and be in rest and at ease, and none shall make him afraid. Fear thou not, O Jacob, my servant, saith the Lord, for I am with thee. I will make a full end of all the nations whither I have driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Yet will I not leave thee wholly unpunished. Israel here, then saved from Babylon, said in Jeremiah 42, verse 11, Be not afraid of the king of Babylon, of whom you're afraid. Be not afraid of him, saith the Lord, for I'm with you to save you and deliver you from his hand. Remember, Jeremiah has been saying all along, is not he? Don't flee to Egypt. Stay in, stay in Judah. The people took took Jeremiah off to eat. They said, "Don't be afraid of the king of Babylon." And um, here, then, they will be uh, delivered after the seventy years uh, captivity. And that that was this this last section here is uh, repeated in in Jeremiah thirty, where very fascinating. You get the context. I don't know if you remember. It's I'm. Struggling to remember each chapter. Um, but back in Jeremiah 30 and 31, you get 
a little book written for the captives. It's a book within a book, chapter 30 and 31. And you get this these verses in verse 10 and 11, or very, very similar, slight difference, but very similar in Jeremiah 30, verse 10 and 11. You get these same promises. See, it says here um, in 30, verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write thee all the words I have spoken to thee, unto thee in a book. And so these are written for the time of captivity uh, to remind the Jews of God's gracious promises to them. And it's especially in the second part of that book, in chapter uh, 31, that we read of a new covenant. And so the great fulfillment comes in Jeremiah 31, 31, where it says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which my covenant they break, although I was an husband unto them, saith the Lord. But this shall be the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel, after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my law in their inward parts and write them in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. Which is exactly what we have described of the gospel in as one place in Corinthians at least and in Hebrews chapters 8 to 10. This is the covenant, the people of Israel being renewed in a new covenant. And of course, it includes the Gentiles. So this great hope here that is set out is quite extraordinary because we see in Jeremiah, it says they will not go wholly unpunished. There will be an end, verse 28, of all the nations. Whether I've driven thee, but I will not make a full end of thee, but correct thee in measure. Now, I have talk about this for a long time but where do all the nations end up then if this is not referring to the whole of the people of God that we've spoken of some of Egypt people of Israel the nations have gone but there's one nation and this covenant that is in there is the covenant of the New Testament which we've seen in Jeremiah 31 so it's a fascinating subject, but what grace it is. Whether we're a Jew or whether we're a Gentile, we don't have to get too hot under the collar about such things. Because in Jesus Christ, all things are made new. There is a hope here. The people of Israel, when they hear about the destruction of Egypt, why shouldn't they be saved? Because God's got a covenant with them. He's got a promise with them, made back to Abraham. And I know some of them are trusting. And they said, we're, we're Abraham's children. And Jesus says to them, no, you're not. You're children of the devil. But those that come to Christ, there is a better covenant, a new covenant, where he does put his law within our hearts, Jews and Gentiles. And he gives us forgiveness of our sins. Because the covenant is in the blood of Christ. And so whether we're an Egyptian or whether we're a Jew, in Jesus Christ, these things are fulfilled. And there's great hope set ahead for all that have come to him. Look at the, what happened to the Egyptians. You think, that was me. I was a proud man. I was going through my life like that, fighting a war against everyone and against God. Thank the Lord that Jesus Christ died for all that trusted him. Egyptians, is Jews, people from all nations. What, what are our nations to us really now? Aren't, isn't our nation as bad as any other? Fighting against God, bringing in godlessness, fighting against the people of God. We pray for our nation. We pray that they repent. We pray that there be a change. Oh, that they would. Oh, that multitudes of the mockers, of Christ will be brought to conviction 
that their end will be like that of the Egyptians. Their strong arms and their shields and their bows and their horses were destroyed. That'd be the end of their nation. But the word of God abides forever. And those that are those that are broken in the battle, those that are the weak, will look unto Jesus Christ that died on the cross. There is the Savior of the world. Jews and Gentiles, let us come to him and look to him. Find comfort in this text that though we deserve to be destroyed like the Egyptians, there is a remnant. Jews and Gentiles saved in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Oh, my Father in heaven, we're surrounded by much evil. Oh, Lord, there is deception even uh, that would be within our own hearts, the deceit of sin, the devices and desires of our own hearts can, can lead us astray. And yet, Lord, we, we see here in what looks like ruin. Uh, people, the people of Israel are, are now uh, gone into Egypt and the Babylonians are coming. And yet what a promise it was to them that they would be delivered. Certainly some of them, all that would be with Jeremiah would be delivered. Barak would be delivered. Barak, who was seeking great things for himself, was to be rejoicing that his Life will be kept for him as a prey, as a, as a spoil of battle. He would still have his life in all the places wherever he went. And we thank thee, Lord, that it's the same now. Oh, Lord, we pray indeed for people of Israel, as it were, in, in, in Jerusalem and these places now that are far from God, far, far away, looking unto old uh, religion of rabbis that has no bearing on the Bible, no no bearing on little bearing on the Old Testament, never mind the new. The people of these nations of Egypt, Lord, mainly caught up in Islam. What what looking so strong, looking so mighty in their uh, Ramadan fasting season, and yet without hope. Oh Lord, we thank thee for the wonder of the gospel of Jesus Christ, this new covenant that replaces the old, that fulfills the old, that completes the old. And when we find with the Lord Jesus Christ, all his people from all nations at peace, as if there's no more nation, there's just the kingdom of God, all the other kingdoms to be destroyed, the glory in Jesus Christ. Lord, help us to be sure and content that whatever enemies are against us, if God be for us, who can be against us? If we've come to Jesus Christ, he is our all in all. We're complete in him. He has satisfied the wrath of God for sin and all his people are one in him and will be kept and will never be lost. And when all this world is burnt up, there will be a new heavens and earth wherein righteousness will dwell. And Lord, it's beyond our imagination, but we know that thou hast promised these things to us. We pray that thou will keep us. Forgive us all of our sins. Lord, give thy people strength, not the strength of armies, not physical strength, but the spiritual armour of God. Put, up, put on us, Lord. Help us put on the armour of God that we may withstand all the fiery darts of the devil. We may be able to stand. Lord, we pray for them that are suffering in war now with these mighty armies against them, that they may look unto Christ. Look unto him and be saved. Look unto him and have life. Look unto him and have a strength, even in weakness, even in death, because death is swallowed up in victory. Our Lord Jesus has conquered it. He's conquered hell. He's conquered sin. He's conquered the devil. 
He's the Lord of all. And his kingdom is a glorious, righteous kingdom that has no end. Oh, Lord, we thank thee. Pray, Lord, keep us in this week. Keep all thy people and strengthen us, Lord. Give us a good testimony of the good things that the Lord Jesus has done for us in his